Napa know-how. A Napa guy knows more isn't always better. Unless we're talking about full-size vans. These beasts do more than get you from A to B. They have so much space a man can live in it. With shag carpeting, water bed, and a sweet lava lamp, these mobile abodes have all the comforts of home. With quality parts and plenty of Napa know-how, you can keep the original tiny house running longer, stronger. That's Napa know-how. Napa know-how. Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Friday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Yes, we finally made it to the end of the week. Jim Garrity of National Review is here. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. As we get ready for the good martini, you might want to hit pause if you have little ears in the car or in the room. Just a quick note of caution before heading into our good martini for Friday. It's uh, Criminal Democrat Friday here on the Three three Martini Lunch. Just last week, we talked about the conviction of former Florida Congresswoman Corrine Brown on over a dozen charges, I believe, 18 charges of corruption and fraud and so forth, all related to a charity for which she raised $800,000 and gave away a whopping $1,200 in educational scholarships. Uh, Not quite sure that much overhead is required for a charitable organization, but uh, nonetheless, she is facing Prison time, and today we get news that the same may be happening for Anthony Weiner. This is NBC News. Disgraced former Congressman Anthony Weiner is expected to plead guilty in federal court Friday morning in connection with a sexting scandal involving a teenage girl. Sources familiar with the deal told NBC New York. Weiner, 52, will plead guilty to a charge of distributing obscenities to a minor, and prosecutors will recommend a prison sentence of about two years. His attorneys are expected to ask for probation when he appears in federal district court in lower Manhattan. The former politician would also have to register as a sex offender, although a judge could rule otherwise. Weiner, once considered a rising star in the Democratic Party, had represented his congressional district in Brooklyn and Queens for almost 12 years before he stepped down in 2011 after admitting to sending sexually explicit social media messages and texts to women. But the sexting did not stop, and a series of explicit exchanges continued in early 2016 with a 15-year-old girl from North Carolina, two highly knowledgeable sources told NBC News. So, Jim, the idea that uh, he would walk with probation is uh, possibly nauseating. The idea that he might not have to register as a sex offender, I really hope that doesn't happen. But uh, the fact that there's a guilty plea from Anthony Weiner here once again means that uh, justice appears to have been done. Yeah, a couple of things jump out here. The first being that for anyone who said, oh, this was, you know, a, a witch hunt or, or the FBI was out to get Hillary and uh, there, was no, there was no reason whatsoever for the FBI to be digging into this and issue that infamous memo about 11 days before the election. Well, look, there was an actual crime committed here. Um, and I don't think there are that many people who would say, oh, it's totally harmless for a, a you know, 30-something, 40-something, however old Wiener is, congressman, to be sending sexually explicit messages to a 15-year-old. Um, that is not merely a bad idea or wrong. It is a crime, and I see nothing wrong with the FBI prosecuting this. The Now, I had gone through the uh, all the different ways that 2016 could have turned out differently, and you can look at this as... If Anthony Weiner had just been a completely different human being, <laughs> this would not have been a factor in the election. If Huma Abedin had divorced him after the first uh, terrible scandal, uh, the first indication that he was uh, you know, having these sorts of inappropriate messages with lots and lots of women and um, sending out pictures of his junk and stuff like that, you know, look, that you know, things might have turned out very differently. If Hillary Clinton had said, look, Huma, I know this isn't your fault, but I just can't be associated with somebody doing something like this, that could have been it. Or even, one of the things that was really baffling, and I say this is a guy who was on Bill Maher's show with Anthony Weiner, Anthony Weiner could have gone through all this and attempted to live his life very differently. And he didn't. <laughs> right? So every one of these things is a result of people making decisions, and these are the consequences of those decisions. So... Uh, the idea that this is some sort of really unfortunate turn of events for Hillary and, and Huma and all these people, and ah, isn't it terrible that the state or the government is going after them? Well, no, these, these, this is a crime here. And once you uh, are, are doing that sort of things, it's natural the FBI will want to take a look at your computer. Once they start looking at the computer, they find emails that were not turned over like they were supposed to, and all of a sudden the investigation has to be reopened again. So I think that decision by Comey, uh, very easy to justify. 
folks who say otherwise are just pretty much in denial of the situation. Uh, they didn't like the outcome, so they want to uh, you know, insist that there's something inherently unfair about that. So uh, it is sad that uh, Wiener has turned into such a twisted soul that he is you know, clearly doing this over and over again. Uh, I understand the Aberdeen Wiener marriage is separate. They have a child, and that is, you know, you got to worry about that, that poor child in the middle of all this. But all in all, um, Anthony Wiener must have known the risks of what he was doing. He must have understood that this is not appropriate grown man behavior, and he did it anyway. And that's where we are. That's, and this is, you know, so this, this is the day the rent became due, the consequences are paid. And, and, you know, um, a guy who has kind of, I, I always found it weird that after the first scandal, Greg, that he was kind of treated as this, ah, wacky Anthony Weiner. You know, there's this strange, he wanted to make a comeback. And a large number of folks in the media were very eager to play uh, an assisting role in that comeback. And I never quite understood that. They got that ludicrously soft focus profile in People magazine. Um, and now I'd like to think that, you know, uh, uh, Wiener is now persona non grata in the realm of politics and media, and that we're going to let him go off and live, uh, deal with the consequences of this, and just stop. I don't, I don't want to hear more about Anthony Wiener anymore. I would like him to leave the state, the national stage, and uh, the rest of us can deal with, you know, uh, less sordid topics than this, which pretty much ranks with just about any topic there is. Greg. Yeah, you make an excellent point. It's interesting that Hillary Clinton uh, at that. Sit down with Christian Amanpour, blame Comey and not Anthony Weiner uh, for the, the the situation that happened there towards the the end of the campaign. There's more in this story from NBC News. I'm desperately trying to keep this topic PG. We're already flirting with PG-13 with the with the content here. The things he asked of this 15 year old girl ought to trouble every normal American. Uh, it's just really, really disgusting. He also apparently had uh, another alias in addition to Carlos Danger. With this girl, he used the alias T Dog. So whatever. Yeah. That- whatever that's worth. Um, Great. Uh, Great. And Jim, some updates as we record here. Anthony Weiner has officially pled guilty to this charge. He has also been ordered by the judge to register as a sex offender. And from what we're hearing, he will not appeal any sentence between 21 and 27 months in prison. Big news today regarding Anthony Weiner. All right, on to the bad martini now. And for listeners uh, who don't know, but I think most of you probably do, uh, Jim actually lived in Turkey for a while, so he knows the the politics and the and and what's going on in Turkey uh, with with a keener eye than most of us do. Also, most of you probably know that the Turkish president Erdogan was in town this week for a meeting with President Trump. They even held a, a joint press conference. What has gotten some attention, but not nearly as much as you would think, is when Erdogan went to the Turkish embassy in Washington, D.C. There were protesters, I believe most of them Kurdish, in a cordoned off area across the street from the embassy being watched by D.C. police. However, as soon as the entourage arrived at the embassy, this wave of Erdogan uh, thugs basically run across the street and don't just get in the face of these protesters. They start wailing on them and beating them to the point where the D.C. police are trying to get in the way. But there's so many of them, uh, there just weren't enough police uh, to, to really get in the way. And they obviously weren't expecting something like this from the Turkish government. It was just just awful. John McCain thinks the ambassador ought to be kicked out of the country for this. Some are saying that Erdogan gave some sort of signal for the, for the beatdown. Uh, Jim, I know you mentioned earlier today that this is the ugliest act of uh, diplomatic violence by a foreign government on American soil, probably since the late 80s, when the head of the South African consulate in Los Angeles, Arjun Rudd, uh, basically declared war on the Los Angeles Police Department, including the sergeants Riggs and Murtaugh, for getting in the way of his massive drug trade, which led to this exchange at the Port of Los Angeles. Diplomatic community. just been revoked. Now, we're not necessarily advocating that as the official policy towards <laughs> the, the Turkish embassy, Jim, but uh, what do you make of the increasingly autocratic tactics from the Turkish government? Okay. Now, for, for those who, uh, I try to be uh, circumspect about my Turkish expertise. I was over there from 2005 to 2007, so my, no- my, my knowledge may have aged a little bit. It may be past its sell-by date. But let me just kind of <laughs> observe that 
we, you know, it didn't take very long, and you knew before you went over there that Turkish cops uh, are the kinds of guys who you know could be very good at their jobs and could deal with uh, you know obviously a dangerous neighborhood, threats of terrorism, things like that. Uh, but generally, they would look at the way, say, the Chicago police had handled the uh, protests outside the Democratic Convention in 1968, and their assessment would be. Okay, you're doing it pretty good, but you got to follow through more on the baton swing on the guy's head. Um, the, the Turkish cops are, I don't know, brutal is, is something that could be fairly applied to all of them, but they very rarely hold back. Uh, civil liberties for protesters are a really kind of disputed concept over there. They exist on paper. They exist in theory. There's a really fair question about whether the protesters' uh, uh, rights uh, exist in, in practice in Turkey. Uh, and, you know, women protesters, it, it was not unusual to see the cops getting rough with protesters in ways that would shock and appall, appall Americans. Now, when a foreign leader visits the United States of America, you need your uh, the equivalent of the Secret Service for them, the, the personal protective detail of that foreign leader and the U.S. Secret Service, the Foreign Diplomatic Security Service and uh, uh, local police all to hopefully work together in tandem and on the same page and the same understandings of how they're going to handle this. And clearly this did not occur in this situation. Um, the Turks seemed to think that they could handle things the way they did back home. Well, look, sorry guys, you're on US soil. Your laws do not apply. Your tech methods and tactics for dealing with those who you deem a threat do not apply because you do not supersede US laws. Um, now in, in light of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the little bit of movie audio we use, no, US police are not allowed to shoot people. <laughs> Just unilaterally declare it's just been revoked. Uh, as much as we might want to see that sometimes, but these what you know governments can do is declare someone persona non grata. That means you are not allowed into in the country anymore, and effectively deport them. Effectively say you have X, you know, twenty four hours or something to get out of the country because you're not allowed to be here anymore. Um, but in this circumstance, it is deeply disappointing that the D.C. police apparently stood by and watched this happen. And they said, well, we didn't want to intervene because the uh, Turkish security personnel were armed. Well, it's kind of their job, isn't it, Greg? <laughs> right. Well, well, we saw the bank robbery going on, uh, but those guys were armed, so we didn't want to deal with it. You know, like, no, <laughs> uh, you know, your job. Oh, wait, what do you have on your a pop gun by your side? Aren't you guys armed, too? You know. These, these protesters, as you know, at least from what we've seen in the video, have, did not violate the law, did not, um, I, I don't really see how you can see them presenting any type of serious threat to the Turkish uh, president or, or, you know, anyone in his party. Um, this is a, a really fundamental breakdown of this. And, and it was a little bit slow on the part of the administration. The State Department did eventually start picking up um, a stronger voice of saying, hey, fellas, you don't get to do this. And so I think certainly... Um, barring all of the security personnel with Erdogan from on this trip, can, uh, from future trips, seems like a perfectly fair uh, response. If you've committed assault on U.S. soil, no, you can't come back into the country. I don't care if you're head of the security detail for Erdogan. you got to go out and find somebody else. We, we can't let those guys back into the country. That is what our laws can do. And conceivably, you know, um, if any of those folks don't have diplomatic immunity, press charges. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Any of them are U.S. citizens or anyone uh uh, are in sort of that, that sort of situation. But look, you, you guys have to honor our laws. Uh, our laws work in offer sufficient protection for every other foreign leader who comes here, every other foreign diplomat who comes here. At the very least, Tillerson should be calling to the Turkish ambassador into his office, calling him onto the carpet and asking you, you know, making it in, in no uncertain terms that this is utterly unacceptable. Um, I don't know whether you need to, you know, uh, reject his credentials and tell him to go back to Ankara, but. Uh, Clearly, there's got to be some sort of uh, you know message to this to say, look, uh, because you know we, we, the world Erdogan is not even the worst in the world, right? There are you know there's the nut job in the Philippines, uh, certainly Putin and Russian security services are in short. Look, when you're in the United States, United States laws applies, and our way of handling with protesters and crowds outside embassies and stuff like that, you don't get to overrule us because you don't like the way, you know, you think we're too nice to people or something like that. So um, hopefully there will be further ramifications of this. It was something that really did not look like America and certainly was odd to see on U.S. soil, people being, you know, put in headlocks and stuff like that. Um, well, D.C. cops are just sitting there watching it all happen. Yeah, not impressive at all. But speaking of cops, you know, we don't refer to the Los Angeles Police Department often, but it just struck me, Jim, that uh, certain people were colleagues that we've referred to, but uh, we never saw them together. Uh, Sergeant Riggs, Sergeant Murtaugh, colleagues of Lieutenant Frank Drebin uh, of the Los Angeles Police Department. <laughs> Drebin might have stood by. Uh... <laughs> 
Or he would have looked at something. He would have noticed something on the ground and, and missed it, like Mr. Magoo or something <laughs> like that. So that that scenario is much more plausible. But yes, you know, you know it's interesting. You don't see a lot of uh, great action dramas about the tough investigators of the D.C. Police Department. You notice that, Greg, huh? <laughs> Couldn't say that too loudly. Besides my next speeding ticket and parking <laughs> ticket, I'll, you know. It also just struck me that Drebin outranks Riggs and Murtaugh, which probably ought to be <laughs> reevaluated. All right. Anyway. Really less property damage, although it's very debatable. <laughs> Jim thus ends the Hollywood Minute, so let's uh, move on now to the crazy martini for Friday. And it was last week that we were talking about the idea from Utah Senator Mike Lee that, hey, Maybe Merrick Garland, who's the chief judge on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals and, oh, by the way, was President Obama's choice for the U.S. Supreme Court last year, ought to be the next FBI director. He's got a prosecutorial background. He led the prosecution on the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, He's got a good reputation. Uh, uh, Mitch McConnell said he liked that idea. Ultimately, Garland didn't want it, and other people kind of uh, diffused that idea before it even got very far. Now it appears that uh, as Trump is putting together this shortlist and whittling it down, That former Connecticut senator, Democrat turned independent, Joe Lieberman, who, by the way, was also the 2000 Democratic vice presidential nominee, is at the top of the list. Uh, Democrats uh, on Capitol Hill don't like the idea. And largely for the same reason, I think, Jim, you and I are puzzled by this, in addition to the fact that I'm not sure why we feel the need to put Democrats on this list a lot. And that's that there shouldn't be politicians at all. Uh, Why can't we find people who are, you know, good at law enforcement? Yeah. Uh, look, this is, you know, people kind of had this reaction when John Cornyn's name was floated earlier this right. week. John Cornyn is a, a, you know, very competent senator, perfectly good at, the, at what he does. He's a very knowledgeable guy. And most of these people, you don't, it, the issue is not that you think they'd necessarily be bad. Was J. Edgar Hoover a political figure? Indisputably. But beyond that, it's almost always been promoting from within. It's almost always been career law enforcement, career prosecutors, usually former agents, the film Breach, which deals with the uh, uh, the turncoat trader Robert Hansen, um, it's about him being a counterintelligence guy and the, the kind of the sense that the, he he has ambitions to be FBI director someday. But he says, you know, they've always been shooters. They've always been guys who kick down doors. It's never been a guy who works in computers and works with uh, with you know other forms of investigative stuff. There's a particular culture to the FBI. As great as John Cornyn is, as great as Joe Lieberman is, I don't think. Um, they, they would be an alien entity, uh, for lack of a better term. They would, they would be something very different. And um, I think I don't think either Cornyn or uh, Lieberman are, are wild, crazed partisans, but every decision they make would be interpreted through a partisan lens because they're form, because we know their politics. They've got years of voting and things like that. Uh, I kind of like the FBI director's pol- personal political views to be a mystery. I kind of don't want to know them because I'd like they're supposed to be beyond politics, above politics, a separate realm from politics. Um, I know McCabe is on the uh, list of potential uh, uh, full-time directors. He's the current acting director. Um, I know his wife is involved in politics, and some conservatives kind of grumble about that. But I think I, ideally you want your law enforcement guys to have nothing to do with the political realm um, and to not be seen as partisans for one side or the other. And after coming after the firing of Comey like this, uh, you really need to bring in somebody who's got as much pu- public trust as possible, as much res- as much respect across the the, uh, the spectrum. And uh, you know, Lieberman. There are a bunch of Democrats who don't like him because of his support for the Iraq War. He lost his primary to Ned Lamont. Um, I don't think this is necessarily a reason to keep him off, but just recognizing this idea that oh, Democrats will like him. No, they won't. Uh, <laughs> the second thing is that uh, Lieberman is, I believe, seventy-five years old. Yes. I mean, like. And traditionally, an FBI director has a 10-year term. Now, I'm not I'm sure he is a great in great shape for a 75-year-old, but this is not an easy job. And uh, you just I don't see him fully serving a full uh, 10-year term. I don't think there's going to be an FBI director in his 80s. Uh, I just don't think the country would be well served with that. It's probably too much for a guy at that age. Um, if people want to accuse me of being ageist, fine. Uh, but I just think that, uh, uh, you know, I, I had a chance to speak to a uh, retired FBI agent earlier this week. And, and, you know, he kind of was saying, look, the morale's not terrible in the FBI. They, you know, most guys are going to get up every day and do their jobs. 
they're committed to going out and you know stopping the bad guys and you know solving crimes. That's that's what they see their mission in life is. But they notice all this political talk about the FBI. They notice all this this debate over this kind of thing, and they they want to put that behind them as much as possible and get back to what they're good at, which is putting bad people behind bars. And I don't know if Joe Lieberman is the easiest way to get to that point. Two quick things as we exit. First of all, excellent Ned Lamont reference. There's a name that has evaporated into the political <laughs> ether over the last decade. Secondly, uh, despite the uh, rabid opposition on a number of fronts to Joe Lieberman, I don't know that Trump has uh, uh, taken him off the list. In fact, yesterday it seemed like he was at the top of the list, which, if true, you know what that means he has, Jim? What? Joe Mentum. <laughs> So I'm wondering, I'm wondering if FBI Director Joe Lieberman, if he has the opportunity, uh, will investigate who was peeking into the window of Ned Lamont back in 2006 in a campaign ad. Uh, this is a really obscure reference. You might, I'll understand if you don't get it, Greg, but uh, one of Ned Lamont's ads had him talking to the camera uh, about what he wanted to do as senator, being very critical of Joe Lieberman, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's this strange figure who comes in in the back and starts looking through the windows. Well, for those who may remember, it's Marcos Molitsas, the creator of Daily Kos, uh, making a very odd cameo in the uh, uh, in the ad. Eventually, he comes through the door and brings all of these excited supporters and says, oh, everybody was so excited about supporting you, Ned, and stuff like that. So the idea of Marcos Molitsas as this weird stalker looking in your window is an image that has never quite left me, Greg. Well, that was well cast. That was well cast, actually. There you go. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> High casting. You might even say. But for those who don't remember, Joe Mentum was a reference to what Lieberman said he had going into the 2004 Democratic New Hampshire primary. And I right. believe he finished fourth, third at best. Uh, and that was pretty much yep. the end of the run for him. So a little trip down memory lane there from uh, Connecticut politics and national politics. So, Jim, we've made it through another week. Congratulations to you. Um, and uh, we'll talk again on Monday. See you Monday, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And be sure to tune in again on Monday for the next Three Martini Lunch. Have a great weekend, everyone. Daddy, where do babies come from? Uh... Well, uh... Honey? Mommy went to the store. Oh, well, you see, um... Well, there's a mommy and a daddy, right? Right. And see, when they call Geico, uh, they could save a bunch of money on car insurance. Oh, really? And that makes them happy? Yes, that makes them very happy. That's good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we could have this talk, sunshine. <laughs> Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer.